All right, here we go. Soldier Boy, we go back 10 years now. That way. You know, we, we've, done, we've done a few little things here and there, but this is our first actual sit down interview, man. Yeah, uh, that way. You know, you, you in the game strong over 10 years now. You know, not a lot of people pull that off. Yeah, man, 10 years in this shit, man, you know what I'm saying? Congrats, congrats. So let's start in the beginning. Now, you were born in Chicago. Yup. Uh, you moved to Atlanta when you were like six. Yup. But you kind of grew up in Mississippi. Yup. So how did you get into music in Mississippi? Because there ain't really a music scene out there. So this is how it went on, bam. I got down, born in Chicago, bam, Cook County, bam. Went to Atlanta, I'm from Atlanta. I'm from West Side Zone, One Simpson Road, you know what I'm saying, that's where I grew up at. Mm -hmm. Bam, I stayed in Atlanta my whole life doing my thing in the streets. I started rapping when I was in Atlanta. Okay. From going to like. So, so at, at what age? Like 14. 14, okay. I started rapping when I was 14. And got down. I, I founded my record label when I was 14. What was the name of it? S-O-D-M-G. Oh, same name. Yep, so got down. Um, Bam, I started rapping in Atlanta. I went to Mississippi and just got on. My daddy gave me a studio. So that, you know what I'm saying? So, I ain't never had no place to record or shit like that. So, so when you say he gave you a studio, what does that mean? Well, it mean he gave me a studio. When I got to Mississippi, like, he, at he his gave house? me a studio. At the house? Yup, at the house. Okay, now when you say studio, like what kind of equipment did it have? Well, it was just a computer, you know what I'm saying? But I had the mic, that's all I needed. Fruity Loops, you know, I make beats on Fruity Loops, and I was recording on this shit called Acoustica Mixcraft. Yeah. You did. So, bam, I was recording on Acoustica and making beats on Fruity Loops. All I needed was a microphone. I bought a microphone from Walmart for like $20, <laughs> and then I just started recording, started rapping. I got famous. Okay, so you started recording at your house with a $20 mic and Fruity Loops. Like, like it was MySpace around back then, or not yet? When I first started doing music, how it popped off was on, um, we had this shit called Sound Click. Sound Click, right. So that was before MySpace, before everything. We had Sound Click, then my music started going up the charts on Sound Click. You know what I'm saying? I was getting uh, 20,000 downloads a day. I was charging 99 cents for the record. They were taking half of the money, so I was making 10,000 a day. Oh, so you started selling music off Sound Click straight off? I started selling music off Sound Click. And I started place, charting on the charts. My first song went like number 27. Next one went like number 10. Next one went like number one over the whole charts. So I was 20,000 downloads a day, $10,000 a day, spending money with the sound click. Bam, MySpace came. It's over with. Okay, so what happened when MySpace came around? I just blew up on my sound click page. I already was number one on the charts. So I put myspace.com slash soldier boy tell. I would no longer be using sound click no more. Why, no, why did you switch from SoundClick if you were making Cause so much Because MySpace was just hard. It was, it was dope. It was better. It was way better. You could put your pictures on there. You could upload videos. You could chat with the fans. They could add you top eight. Oh, it was just new. Bam, went to MySpace. I had like a million plays in the, in the day. Okay. Now, now, this is before Crank That? Just before Crank That. Okay, so what were the first few songs that were really charting? Shoot Out. You know what I'm saying? Doo Doo Head. Yeah, bitch, yeah, you know what I'm saying, shit like that. This all documented. If y'all, y'all watching this interview, if y'all want to check it out, go to soundclick.com slash soldierboy or put slash soldierboy5 and it's going to show you all. It's, 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 it's set in stone. I ain't even got to explain it. Y'all can just go look it up and okay. show you all the songs. The first, from my first tone to my last song. Okay, so you're coming out with these songs. They're yep. charting. Yep. You're starting to build a buzz on the internet when, you know, now that's real common, but back then there was no such thing. You know what I mean? Like, like musicians weren't building a buzz off the internet. You were like nah. the only one doing that. So you, you didn't really even have anyone to look up to. Mm -mm. You had to just kind of make it up as you went along. Yep. But what did you learn early on in those days? Um, I learned that it was a real career. It was real money. It was real like fans. You know what I'm saying? I was in the hood, trapping and shit. You know what I'm saying? Selling dope, selling weed. You know what I'm saying? Doing all type of shit. Then bam, I did my first show. They gave me like 1500. Hmm. I quit. 
and I just kept doing it. My next show was 7,000. Huh. And this is before Crank That? I had Crank That then. Okay, so you dropped Crank That? Yup, but I was just in the streets. I didn't want to sign yet. Crank That came out before the deal. They just blew it up when I got signed. Right, because you actually put Crank That out yourself first. By myself. Okay, so you're putting these songs out, you're getting a buzz, you're getting a bunch of views, you're starting to get shows. What happened when you released Crank That by yourself? By real current. Let me show you, for, for everybody that's watching every two, they probably gonna be like, damn, so he just put the songs out, they got popping, like how he do it, he put no money in it. So let me tell you, I just do it first before we get to that. This how I got popping. They had an app called LimeWire. And right. it was basically illegally downloading and shit. Yeah, it was, uh, Napster and LimeWire was kind of neck and neck at that point. Yeah, so bam, I made a LimeWire account. I would download all the songs. I would look at the Billboard charts, top 20. I download those 20 songs. I upload them to LimeWire. And I, I upload Crank That to LimeWire. And I title it 50 Cent in the Club. Ugh. Britney Spears, Wooty Wooty Woo. Eminem, do the da da da, whoever the fuck was popping at that time. Then they'll go there, download that song for free. Like, I'm finna get 50 cents at the club. They'll hit download, they hit play, it go, you don't, don't, don't. So they're like, what the fuck is this? About, you know what I'm saying? About probably like a minute in. They're like, damn, this shit hard. And they, who the fuck is Soldier Boy? And I just, ha, 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 ha. I kept going, kept going, kept I like, damn, look, they downloaded 50 cents. In the club, 50,000 times. That means 50,000 people just heard Soldier Boy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's how, I, that's how I got popping. And bam, when I dropped Crank That first, ain't nothing happened. You know what I'm saying? It was just a regular song. I was riding around to it in the streets every day just playing it. Soldier Boy, I, was in I ain't really had no dance to it yet or nothing. It was just a song. And I was just riding around bumping it. And it was just another song that everybody thought was bumping. I did my first show, I performed it. They thought it was hard, but it wasn't, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't what it was. Right. And then. I know what that shit just blew the fuck up. It started taking off. I got seven million plays on MySpace. You know what I'm saying? And then I just started going crazy doing shows, 10,000 a show. You know what I'm saying? That shit just uh, took the fuck off. Well, I remember before you even got signed, I was hearing about this song. And, you know, I was still DJing back then. This is, this is kind of like right before Vlad TV. And I remember all these DJs was talking about how they wanted to copy the song, but like, it wasn't exactly like a high quality, you know what I'm saying? Like, super studio mixed version. Like I the recorded version it put, in my house. Right, exactly. The version you put out was still Fucked rough. Up. Yep. You know, so th they wanted to play it, but they couldn't really get a high quality version. Yep. And, and it's sort of like, it kind of created a demand amongst the DJs. Okay, I ain't know that, that's dope. Yeah, yeah. That's I, dope. I, I remember uh, I heard the story from a bunch of people like that. So. You putting this stuff out by yourself, and you actually dropped an album. Yeah, Stack, uh, was it Stacks on Deck or album before the album? Yeah, Unsigned and Still unsigned, Major. Yeah, unsigned Still Major. The album before the album. Yeah, Unsigned, unsigned and Still Major. I'm on the cover with the black and yellow on, Bay Nate, straight out the truck. Everything going crazy. Okay. Everything going crazy. I dropped the CD, bam, my OG. Shout out Mammy Mike, Palm Tree Entertainment. He pressed up like. Like 50,000, 100,000 CDs, and we hit the road. That shit was hard. So you, you were pushing your own independent album that you pressed up yourself, no deal, no deal, no, no man, money, we, 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 you know, no, no major money, just all yourself. All my, by myself. Me and my OG, Miami Mike, PGE. Now, now but before that money started to come in, before the show money and the, the CD money and stuff like that, like how heavy were you in the streets? Real heavy in the street. Yeah? All the way in, you know what I'm saying? Tap in, man, I'm from Zone 1, I'm from Simpson Road, you know what I'm saying? I'm from West Side. I done stayed all the way around the Zone 3. I lived in the Zone 3. I stayed on Deal Avenue. Me and a lot of those savages used to stay in the same house. Mm. You know what I'm saying? We used to live in the same house in Zone 3, on Deal Ave. I stayed in Pittsburgh, right next to the corner cash, free corner cash. I stayed next door to Quanty Cash in Pittsburgh. I stayed in Zone 3. I stayed in McCannaville. Got down, all that. But I'm from, the, I'm from the west side, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, we tapped in you know, all the way in. That's why I love music, because it changed my life. 
I mean, when you talk about the dope game, I mean, weed usually is kind of calm, but when you talk about coke and crack, it, it gets a little crazy. Yep. Like, what do you think was the most fucked up situation you went through before all that? Probably like, just like, uh, like police kicking in our door and shit. Police kicked in your door? Yeah, that probably used to be like the worst shit, you know what I'm saying? Feds, police, they boom, kick your shit in, come in that motherfucker 10, 15 deep, lock everybody up. And you just in that motherfucker by yourself, you know what I'm saying? Like, damn, like. Yeah. And you're what, like 15, 14 years old doing this? Yeah. You're you a baby. Little nigga, you know what I'm saying? But that's what they had. Everybody started young, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Young, go walk to the train, bam, J come, bam, another J come, bam. Jay's knocking at the door, two in the morning, I can't sleep, I gotta go to school the next day. Junk is knocking at my front door. Yeah. I used to hate that shit. What was your dad saying during this time? Shit. I went with my dad. I was with my mom. Oh, you were with your mom? Okay, you were with mom in Atlanta. Oh, your dad was in Mississippi, your dad, mom was in Atlanta. Yep. So what was your mom saying during this time? Nah, that go, we was fucked up, so I had to do what I had to do. Now I was the man of the house. So I had to get it, you know what I'm saying? By any anywhere it means, you know what I'm saying? I feel you. I feel you. So the song starts to take off. You start touring around with the song. Yeah. When does uh, Mr. Kali Park come in? I had an uh, email on my MySpace. I put a e my email on a uh, soldier boy. Tell them at tmail.com. You should go to my sidekick. You said tmail. Tmail. Right, the sidekick. Straight of course. my sidekick. Yeah. Bam. I get an email. Kali Park Music. I want to sign you to a record deal. Right. I'm on my sidekick. I'm like, what the fuck? Record deal. Kali Park, I heard that before. Yin Yang Twins. Yin Yang Twins, yeah. Uh, Kali Park, Bubba Spark. And then he had Hurricane Chris at the time. So I, he was getting on with that ABB Bay shit. So I said, let's do it. I thought he was bullshit. I said, man, man, nigga ain't finna sign me. I said, all right. You want to sign me? Come to my hood. Pull up to my house and meet me where I'm at. He said, I'm going to be there tomorrow. I said, all right, bet. I'm sitting at the crib. I got home from school. I'm chilling. It about 3, it about 4.30. I see about 3, 4 limousines pull up in the front of the trap. <laughs> I see about 10 niggas hop out with all suits on. I said, what the fuck? I looking out the window. I said, oh, shit. My daddy just got out of work. I'm like, daddy, daddy. I said, any folks in the front yard? He said, well, what the fuck you done did? He look out the front yard. He see about four scratch limousines, 10 niggas with suits hop out. He like, man, what the fuck you got going on? I said, man, he, they want to sign me to a record deal. He said, what, nigga? I said, yeah, I, you know, I've been doing my rap shit. You know, they want to sign me. He got this money. Da, 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 da. They came in the house. I met Kali Park, you know what I'm saying? He took me out to eat, we sat down, had dinner. Took my whole family out to eat, we sat down, chopped it up, what you want, you know? Tell me what you want to do. I was like, man, I'm trying to take over the world. I got talent, I just need to push. I'm hard, I got hits, I'm young, I'm swagged out. I'm the hottest rapper out right now in the streets, you know what I'm saying? Mm. He said, okay, cool, sign me in my living room. Put but he pulled out the contract right then and there? Right in my living room, like 20, okay. 20 30 page contract. You're how old at this Big point? Big ass chick. Probably like 15. You're 15 years old. So can you even sign a contract at 15? Your My dad, dad had, was right there with me. So your dad had to sign it for you? Or we signed to it together. Signed it together. Okay, so aren't you supposed to have a lawyer when you sign a deal like we that? When they got it uh, notarized. No, but I'm saying, but aren't you supposed to have a lawyer to look over it? Man, I'm straight out the hood. Fuck all that. You're like, fuck all that. I need the money right now, bitch. Okay, so you pulled out a 20-page 20, 20 contract. Yeah. And he had a check for you right then and there? Yup. Can you say how much? I ain't gonna tell y'all how much, but it was, a nice, it was enough to make me get the fuck up out the hood and I'll be scraped forever. Was it six figures? I ain't gonna, you know what I'm saying? I ain't gonna say, okay. It was enough though. It was enough? I will right, disclose this though. My fr I did two deals. My first deal was straight with Kyler Park. It set me straight. My second deal was with Interscope. It was a million dollar deal. I put, they put a million dollars cash straight okay. in my pocket. So, uh, I, I kind of want to set it all up chronologically so people understand. Because you know, I, I feel what you did was important. Because you're the first one to actually do it. You know what I'm saying? So I want people to understand the blueprint. Let do it. So you sit down with Kali Park. He signs you to his production company, right? Kali Park Music, I guess? Kali Park Music. Right. You sign the deal. He gives you a check. Yep. Not the huge check, but a nice check. Mm-hmm. 
What happens after you sign with him? Everything go crazy. Everything go crazy. I signed a check. My daddy said, all right, this is what you want to do. This is what you want to do. I was like, yeah, this is what I want to do. I went straight to the dealership, bought me a car. What'd you buy? I bought, it wasn't nothing crazy. I bought a Chrysler 300. But for me, at 15 cash, that shit was hard. Well, the, the, that, that, was, that was the, you know, everyone who couldn't get the Phantom would get the 300 back then and that swag was, it out. Crack, crack, Chrysler 300, those went up, got the frames on it. I'm right. stunning. You know what I'm saying? Got my chain. He gave me a chain, college part chain. Oh, okay. It was worth like thirty-five thousand. I was that was it. And then after that, I was just on. Bam! The next day they call, oh, your song on the radio. They put crank. They, they said, no, that day that I signed. They said, what song you want to go with? I said, crank that. Okay. Now, now did did Kylie Park go in the studio and remaster it and everything else like that first? Yup. We went to the studio and re-recorded the song. From in scratch. A, in a big studio from scratch. Okay. And that's the one that everybody here now. You the main one. It sounds good as fuck. Right, because Kylie Park studio was, that was, bro, that was like the I still never found a studio with that quality to this day. Still. Right. And Kylie Park is a real accomplished, super talented producer. So yeah. he, he basically took the rough idea and turned it into a, a radio. Masterpiece. Yeah, to a masterpiece. So you get in there. Did he really like help out? You know, nah, uh, creative. I had that shit going. I, you had it all going. He always let me do what I you know. What I'm saying, they try to tell me shit, and I'd be like, "No, y'all know what the <laughs> fuck y'all talking about. You off beat, bitch. This how it's supposed to sound. This the new shit. I'm doing that on purpose. Don't slide. Just can we slide it over just a millisecond to the right so you aren't beat? No, do it like this, motherfuckers. You know what I'm saying? P paying my verse negative 100, paying this verse a positive 100. You'll do my ad. You know what I'm saying? I heard that shit bad. Damn, they mixed it, mastered it, and they did their thing. But as far as like rapping and the beat, I made the beat and I wrote the song. Yeah. I received 100 percent of all the royalties. Right, and that's and that's important because usually when you my see my album it, went platinum, Crank right. that sold 10 million, it went diamond. I sold more than Thriller. I sold more than Michael Jackson Thriller with Crank that. So you 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 go in and mix and master the final version of Crank that. It goes to the radio, and then it just goes like wildfire. Wildfire. And it, was, it wasn't just Atlanta, it was... The first was Atlanta, it started in Atlanta. Yeah. That's how it blew up. The next day he called DJ Greg Street, played it on the radio in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. First time he played it, it was it. As soon as they, they kept calling back, Soldier Boy cranked it, Soldier Boy cranked it, and it was it. It just went crazy. When did Interscope come in? Interscope came in, like, probably like, Two weeks after the Collie Park deal. Aha. Uh -huh. And the song was already on the radio at this point? Yeah. It was on the radio. In, in Atlanta or everywhere? In Atlanta. It started in Atlanta. Then after Atlanta played, you know, everybody else they got to play with Atlanta play. Yeah. It went number one on the radio in Atlanta. Then everybody played it. New York, North Carolina, California. Oh, it started going through the South and then to the West. Everywhere. Okay. So at this point, you're coming from a position of power because you, you're not getting that, that sucker deal that most new artists get because you got a song that's already on fire. Hell yeah. So Interscope come in, but who else was, was, was trying to talk to you at this point? Because once the song is on fire, all the labels start to kind of swoop this in, the right? the fucked up part. I signed my deal, JD called the next day, said, I want, I want to sign you for three million. <laughs> <laughs> Jermaine Dupree called me. So, so deaf. A nigga that signed Bow Wow, he called me the next day. I want to sign you for three million. It's so, so deaf. Well, but but, but Kylie Park been around the block. How come Kylie Park didn't want to wait and, and sort of... I don't know about none of that, but I was just like, damn. But it panned out good because I made way more than three million dollars. But still, though. But still, though. Fuck. I could have had three M's off the top. <laughs> when you signed your Interscope deal, how old were you? 16. You were 16 years old, staring at a million dollar check. Yep. You know, granted, you know, parts of it have to go to other people and so forth, but that's still yeah. a million dollar check with your name on it. Yep. How does a 16 year old really process that in his head? Go crazy, start screaming, running around the house, yelling. Break down, tears of joy. You start crying. Nah, I ain't gonna even lie and cry. But I was real turned up. Yeah. I was yelling, I was yelling, screaming real loud, running around the house. Of course, as you should. I was just like, ah, damn, ah, ah. 
that was it. I was like, fuck, a million dollars, nigga. A million dollars. I was like, bro, a million dollars. I'm from the hood, nigga. I'm from the trap. I ain't never had shit. We came up from the lights getting cut off. We came up from selling crack, selling weed. We came from the police kicking in our doors. You know what I'm saying? We came from fuck shit. A million dollars, nigga. A million fucking dollars. I was like, oh, bro, you don't understand. I can't even explain that shit. Yeah? I thought it was a trick. So look, when Interscope stuck then, it went crazy. I shot the music video in Atlanta in my old hood, right up the street from my right, old house. Wasn't Jack Thriller in the video? Yeah, Jack Thriller was in the video. Bow Wow was in the video. Amariam was in the video. DJ Unk was in the video. I don't know who else was in the video. It was hard. My daddy was in the video. Hmm. My OG was in the video. Lil Duval was in the video. Right. And Jibs was in the video. It was lit, man. And we got them, um, I shot the video. They called me. They said, your video going to be on 106 and Park tomorrow. Rode around the hood, I told the whole hood. I was still in high school. I told everybody to watch BET tomorrow. The video came on, on 106 and Park. The next day I left the road and I was on tour for like six months. Okay, so, so that song, Crank That, I've always wondered, what exactly does it mean? What? Like, what, what, what does Superman that whole mean? Superman that whole is dance. It's a dance, like, like all right, so let me take, check it out. Bam, this is what happened. It's two different meanings to it. The meaning that the white, like, no, 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 my bad. White people, they, they said it's like nothing on a girl back and you put a sheet on her back and stick it to her back. She was like Superman, Superman. That wasn't what it was. That's what it was. I don't that know was. what the fuck, where the fuck they came from. <laughs> what it really was is that hoe is not a girl. It's not pertaining to a girl. Like that hoe is like, like an item or like that thing. Like, 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 you know what I'm saying? I don't know how to explain it, but it's like, it's like a dance. It's not talking about a girl. But everybody, it's a hoe, so everybody's like, oh, he talking about a girl. So like Superman, that hoe is like, it's a dance. It's like Superman, like, like, like I don't know how to say it. It's like a dance, though. It's like, it's saying Superman, this is Superman, that hoe. So right. like, Superman, Superman that, that hoe. hoe, that dance. That Superman, yeah. that hoe, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or goddamn, uh, we had a whole bunch on Batman, that hoe. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Alley Oop, that hoe. Slam Dunk, that hoe. Uh, Ice, you know, uh, Water Whip, that bitch. You know what I'm saying? You know, you know, slip. You know what I'm saying? Shit like that. But so they thought I was talking about a bitch. It's a dance. Okay. So you put out the the video. Now everyone starts doing the dance. Yup. And people start making their own little videos. Yeah. I put up a dance video of us dancing to the song. Right. And then everybody just repeated that video. So so when you see these these songs that blow up on Vine, you know, like. Like for example, what, what's what's the newest one? Uh, you, you ugly, you daddy's son. Uh, what's the name of that song? Juju on the beat. Yeah, Juju on the beat. You know how like songs like that blow up because people yeah. make little Vine videos and everything yeah. else like that. Yeah. You were the original one <laughs> to do that. You were the original Vine star, <laughs> internet sensation. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. Yeah. how you were the first person where the fans took what you started and started creating their own viral content that helped support what it is that you were doing. Yup. Like, how, how did it feel to see that, to really see suddenly your fans are creating their own versions of your shit? It was dope, you know what I'm saying? I was like, man, this is a good, you know, promotional marketing, you know, tagged it. It's dope. It's gonna, it's gonna spread my record. But Beyonce danced to it. Beyonce danced to it? On her show in Atlanta, they called me, man, Beyonce just danced to your song. So, on so her Beyonce show. was Superman in that hoe? Yup. YouTube, Beyonce cranked that. You're going to see her doing it on her show. That's what really blew me up. After she did it, I was like, I got they, I was hella famous. So, the song ended up going number one for seven weeks. Number one, Hot 100, Top 200, all that. Number one, Billboard, across the world, all genres. The album goes platinum. A million copies sold. So, on top of that million dollars you got, now you got millions more coming in. That way. Do you know how many millions more came off during that time? Was it another five, ten million? Like seven. Another seven million? Yeah. So you, you 16 years old, sitting on like seven, eight million dollars. Yeah. What is the craziest shit you spent your money on during that time? Uh, all I bought was cars and jewelry and houses. Houses. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't really no crazy shit. Like, 
and ain't really nothing else. Like, you know what I'm saying? The craziest shit was like my Lamborghini chain. Everybody was like, man, you crazy. What the fuck? All right, you got the Lamborghini. It's like a hundred, it was a hundred thirty thousand dollar chain or something. Some shit like that. It was a remote control chain, all black diamonds, coming remote. Got to drive it around. That was like the most crazy. That was like, okay. And then I had to chill for me. I was like, damn, I'm tripping. Like, what the fuck? Well, <laughs> I remember the first time I started making money, and it ain't the type of cut money you were making, but it was, you know, for me, it was, it was some real money. Yeah. I remember all the fuck shit I had to go through. Yeah. I remember all the fake friends, all the fake women. Uh, the drama, the, the stealing, you know, just, and, and also not really knowing how to handle money, thinking it was just going to come forever at, the, at this rate when it never does. You know what I'm saying? Like, just, you know, you got your ups and downs. Yeah. So what was some of the fuck shit that was happening during this time? Because you're still a teenager. You know, you don't know how to handle all this shit yet. Yeah. So, so what's the bullshit you had to deal with? Uh, a friend stealing from me, you know what I'm saying? My assistant, my assistant stole uh, twenty thousand dollars from my bank account. Wow. You know what I'm saying? If you go on YouTube and search it, Soldier Boy's assistant steals money. You can see the whole story. He stole twenty thousand from from my bank account and said that he owed some people or some shit. And and you know, I was like, you should just ask me for the money. I would have gave it to you. So. I had to fire him, you know what I'm saying? Everything else was kind of straight. I was just living in hotel suites, buying big ass, having big ass houses and tour buses across the world. You know what I'm saying? Shit was straight, really. It wasn't really no crazy shit. It was fun as a motherfucker. What, what was the craziest shit females did to, to try to get your attention during this time? Try to get my attention? Just at shows? I mean, everything. Out. Bitches, up, you know, get naked right in front of you, you know what I'm saying? Try to suck your dick right down the spot, wherever you at. Pulling up their titties, at the, you know, showing their titties in, in this crowd, trying to go backstage. Bitches jumping on the motherfucking car, jumping on the cars, and tour buses and shit, chasing our vans and shit. All type of shit. When I was young, it was crazy, you know what I'm saying? I had that bow outfit, so I'd be, bitches be chasing me and shit, little, little girls. Yeah. Now I'm older, it's like bad, strip of bad bitches and shit. Right. So you come off that album, Monster. Your name is popping. You got you got money. And and actually, that song ended up getting on Entourage, right? I don't know. It went on, on everything. I, don't, I can't remember the, the specific names and shit. But yeah. yeah, it was licensed to a lot of movies and TV shows and shit. Right. So I'm, nine times out of ten, hell yeah, it was on Entourage. <sighs> right. And and just to reiterate, unlike most other artists during that time. You wrote the song and you produced it, and you had all your publishing. Yep. Okay. So, so Kali Park didn't didn't take part of the publishing or the deal or nothing else like that. Nah, I I didn't do my pub deal until like um, 2011. I don't want to get into all that though, but I'm gonna keep okay. it real though. I, yeah, he had he had he had my, he had parts of my pub. But, but that, that's typical in New York. He had parts of my pub. I had got a lawyer, new management, and I got 100% of all my shit back. Okay. So that's how that went. So so you're sitting there making residuals like crazy. Yep. Not only, you're getting album sale residuals, you're getting publishing residuals, yep. and, and you wrote and produced the song, yep. which is rare. Yeah. You know, usually the producer come in and, you know. Yeah, that was some crazy shit. I'm glad that happened too. And the whole album you produced? I produced the whole album, 90%. I, probably I used one beat from Cody Park, so he got 10%, so I produced yeah. 90% of the album. Crazy. 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 The whole robbery thing, does that happen before the second album or after the second album? The robbery happened after the second album. Okay, so let's get into the second album. So the second album is I Saw, I saw Boy, Boy Tell, tell Him. Why, why'd you call it that? I called it that because that whole Mac Apple wave was hit hard. iMac, all that. Apple came to my video shoot and cranked that. Huh. Tell them what you want to tell them. Apple came to that video. Apple came to my video shoot, cranked right. it, and gave me the iPhone, the first one that they ever had. They gave it to me. I was like, damn, what the fuck? Woody, woody, woody. Basically, when I got on, I was still in the hood, trapping and capping and shit. I, 2008, 2000, 2006, I still was in the hood. I ain't do my deal yet. Jibs was popping from St. Louis. Uh -huh. He had a song called Chain Ain't Low, Woody, Woody, Woody. The nigga called me. Flew me to St. Louis. He wanted to sign me. 
I felt like I was too big to sign with another rapper, so I went with Interscope. But I fuck with Jibs, he my nigga. When I met him, he told me, yo, all that window shit is out. Hmm. Everybody in this industry use Apple products. We use MacBooks, we use iMacs, we use whatever the fuck he said. So I said, all right, whatever. He my nigga, I believed him. I went and bought a fucking MacBook. I went and bought all Apple shit. I threw all my window shit away. Then. Windows, they seen that because I'm popping with Crank Dad. Every time I do my YouTube videos, they see my MacBook. So they bam, they came to my video shoot the Crank Dad. They gave me that, that first ever iPhone. It was hard as fuck. It was just a way. So I call everything was iPod, iPad, yeah. iPhone. So I said, I saw the boy tell him. So you dropped the album. Did you produce the whole thing again? Nah, this one I produced probably like 50% of the album, and the other 50 went to like Zaytoven. Ah, you were working with Zayto. Yeah, that I cashed that nigga out for hella beats. I let him, I let him take over. He did like, he was, he, he like executive produced my second album, Zayto. I love Zayto, man. He the hardest producer ever, man. Yeah, from the Bay Area I was, too. I was in my hood, I was in my hood bumping Gucci Man every day in the hood. So them beats were stuck in my head, the, mel the melodies. Uh, oh, so that's why you reached out to him. Hell yeah, so once I got on, I made a mean nah, I was like, nigga, get Zayto in this motherfucker. I was in the trap, broke, bumping his shit every day do my second album. Huh. So that's how that came about. Okay, and, and you're still signed to... Um, Interscope. Okay, but you're still fucking with uh, Kylie Park? Still fucking with Kylie Park. Okay, so you dropped the second, the second album. Go. Kiss Me Through the Phone. Kiss Me Through the Phone, Platinum. No, two, number one. Two million downloads. Two million sold. Another hit, not, not quite as big as Crank That. Not quite as big, but, but still But, but, but still it hella big. In its own right. Wasn't a dance, wasn't a, you know what I'm saying? It was kind of a love song. Straight to the bitches. Yeah. Turn my swag on. Same album. Hot up out the bitch. Turn my swag on. One million downloads. Platinum. Platinum. Platinum, nigga. So you had two, two platinum singles off that. Two platinum singles off my second album. So you still going strong at this point. You, I'm going crazy. You going crazy. What, what changes in your life by the time the second album comes around? I turned 18, so I was kind of a man. I've been a man since I was in the streets, but I was kind of was officially like a man. I was still a little boy on my first job. My first deal, I was a little boy. So you're only 18 with two albums out with platinum singles on both. Yup. Killing it. Going crazy. Going crazy. Torn 45,000 a show. 45,000 a show. Coming on tour with Lil Wayne. Huh. Lil Wayne got on the Turn My Swag on remix. Right. Went in, went in the studio with Puff Daddy. Mr. Nigga that signed B.I.G. I'm with Legends now. You know what I'm saying? Working with Kerry Hilson. We in the studio every day. Me and Tiana Taylor working every day. Rihanna, me and Rihanna working, met Nicki Minaj. Right, because Nicki was rolling with, uh, with Gucci, Gucci Man at that time, yeah. Met, Nuki, met Nicki Minaj before she was signed to a major. Yeah. She was just signed to Lil Wayne. She was like, I'm signed to Lil Wayne, you know, I'm from New York. I'm, you know, I'm a rapper. I made songs with her doing, while I was working on my second album, I recorded with Nicki Minaj. You know, we, we made a lot of music together, you know what I'm saying? Me and Gucci Man made a lot of music together. Like that second album was just dope for me. You know what I'm saying? Like it was just a gro it was a growing growing spurt, a, gro a growth in my career. Yeah. Performed at the BET Awards, Michael Jackson tribute. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Performed, turned my swag on, hopped out the bed. LeBron James in the crowd. You know what I'm saying? Met Kanye, produced for Kanye. You know what I'm saying? Met, you know, met, met Kanye, you know, Amber, met Amber Rose in the studio with Kanye. Yeah. You know, produced, produced like hella, hella, hella beats for him and shit. Worked on the Robocop remix. It never came out. Nominated for a Grammy at this point. Right. Well, you were nominated for your first album, right? I was nominated for Crank That. For Crank That, yeah. I got the nomination a year later. For? Crank That. Okay, yeah, Crank at That. At 18, doing yeah. my second album. Oh, I see what you're saying. That's when I got the nomination. Okay. So I was at the Grammys like, this shit crazy. Surreal. All in a year, you know what I'm saying? Last year I was just in the trap doing independent shit. 
trying to get it. So you on top of the world. You working with everybody, you know, I made for a Grammy. Second album got multiple platinum singles. You on top of everything. And then the robbery happens. Yep. So what happened previous to that robbery in terms of where you were? Because it was like an album release so party ba or something? Basically, tell me what you heard. I heard you were at an album release party, you were at your house, and between three and six dudes with masks came in with AK-47s. So basically, I bought this club in Atlanta called Excalibur. You bought a club? Yeah. Okay. I own this club in Atlanta called Club Excalibur. I bought it. It was always the lit spot. All the rappers come, everybody always come. It was like, um, my album release party at my club. We chilling in the club. Some niggas follow me back to my crib. I got a double gate in my community at the time. I'm living in Atlanta, Georgia, in the mansion. Double gates. Niggas come through the gate. Well, so you got a security gate and then a gate in front of your house? No, I got a gate. You get to the gate, you go through that gate, and you got to go through another gate. Okay, so it ain't like a security gate with security guards and yeah. stuff like that? No, when, yes, niggas, it wasn't nobody at the gate. Okay. Well, nobody at the gate. Okay, so two gates. Okay, I got you. But somebody lived in the community that they knew that let them in. Oh, you know what I'm saying. So they get into the community. Get in the community. I'm chilling in the studio. Me and A. Rab in the studio. Jabbar in the living room. My other partner, Killer S. O. D. M. G. He in the living room. Who I interviewed recently. Nah, you interviewed Killer J. Oh, okay. Killer was in the living room. Different killer, all right. So I'm sitting in the, uh, it's four of us. Uh, Jabbar went in to take the trash out. He come back in, soldier. I just seen some fans ride by the house. Um, while I was taking the trash out, I said, what the fuck? Some fans grab the pistol, go outside, look, I don't see shit, come back in the crib. I'm in the studio listening to some beats. All I hear is boom, real loud. Instantly stop the music. I just hear my fucking run. I hear, I hear doo -doo -doo. My, my partner say, "Man, who the fuck in, who the fuck in this crib?" A rap passed me the pistol. Bam! I look through the door. I see like three, four niggas running through the crib, all black, mask on, running through the crib and shit. One nigga run to the front door. I hop out. I start shooting. Bow, 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 bow. Shot the nigga. Bow, shot his ass. Bow, 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 bow. All the niggas run out the door. They run out the door. This nigga on the floor. Feel me? Walk up to this nigga. Take, this, take his mask off his head. Looked at it, saw who it was. I'm like, damn. Shot his ass again. Bow. He screaming and shit. Ah, fuck. I shut the door. When you took the mask off, did you, see, you knew who it was? I knew who it was. Oh, wow. So it was an inside job. Well, you, you knew who he was. I know who he was. I'm like, damn. Shot his ass. Bow. Go back in the studio. Shut the door. All I hear is, doom, 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 doom. Somebody coming up the thing. I open up the door again. I start shooting. Bow, bow. That's my nigga. It's killer. He like, man, pass me the gun. I said, man, I ain't giving you shit, nigga. Fuck that. Bam. Police pull up. That was the end. These guys get shot up. The other guys run off? Yep, they left him. They left the dude, they left their homie. Mm -hmm. Police arrive. It's clearly self-defense. The guy is still on the floor? Yeah. He's still alive? Yeah. No, no, no. I He's don't want to talk about all that. Okay. So the police arrive. Were the police cool with you or, or were y'all like? It was good. Everything was good. Okay. And it was self-defense, 100%. Self-defense. Self-defense. So then they leave. Well, the, the coroner comes, I guess, and takes the dude away, and, and, and they leave. How paranoid are you at this point? When? Like, as soon as this shit happened? Afterwards. I mean, I was just like, like, damn, this shit crazy, you know what I'm saying? I was just like, you feel me? And you were getting threats? Uh, yeah, 
I call it sneak this. I haven't seen a lot of sneak this. We gonna get you, nigga. Look at my movie. YouTube, uh, go on iTunes or go in whatever y'all got to watch movies, Netflix, whatever. Go to, to search Soldier Boy the movie. And this whole story is in the movie. Okay. It's one of these situations that changes you forever. And, and at this point, didn't them dudes start making videos? Like with masks on and shit like that? That's in the movie, yeah. <laughs> the niggas that really made the videos though, all, them video, all the videos that was made by niggas with masks, none of them was the true people. All that was just joke parodies. That wasn't oh. real shit. So, so someone was just trying to capitalize yeah. off. Yeah, the people who really did the shit and really got into it, they never made videos and said shit. Today's episode of The Vlad Couch is brought to you by Blue Apron. Food is better when you start from scratch. Fresh, high-quality ingredients taste better and are better for you, so it's important to know where your food comes from. Blue Apron knows that when you cook with incredible ingredients, you can make incredible meals, so they set the highest quality standards for their community of artisanal suppliers, family-run farms, fisheries, and ranchers. Look, Blue Apron can be delivered to 99% of the continental U.S. and 99.5% of food deserts. And because Blue Apron ships the exact amount of each ingredient required for a recipe, they're reducing food waste. So what's inside your Blue Apron delivery? Farm fresh seasonal produce, meat with no added hormones, sustainably sourced seafood, and everything else you'll need. Some of the meals available in January are creamy shrimp fettuccine with sauteed green beans and spinach, sweet chili chicken with Tinkerbell peppers, green beans and jasmine rice, Spiced steak and tomato avocado salad with creamy cone cabbage and red onion slaw. Yeah, all that stuff. So look, this is crazy. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals for free. That's right, for free, including free shipping, by going to blueapron.com slash couch. you love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. That's blueapron.com slash C-O-U-C-H. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Then the third album comes out. Yeah, the DeAndre way. The DeAndre way. 100,000 copies. Which is good, but compared to what you were doing, it wasn't, it wasn't of that caliber. Plus it didn't, I mean, it had a, hold on a second. Let me get my book. Turn My Swag On is on there. No, Turn My Swag On is on the second album. On this one, I, oh, no, 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 I, no, no, I yeah. had speakers going hammer, and I had Blowing Me Kisses. No, wait, Pretty Boy Swag is on this. And Pretty Boy Swag. Pretty Boy Swag. Was that the big single on there? That was the big single. Right. Went platinum, so. Went platinum? Good, you know? Pretty Boy Swag went platinum, so we still, I was like, yeah, that way. Okay. So. Mm. And the album did cool, but it didn't do what your last two albums did. It did what the last album did. Okay. What was the relationship with Interscope at this point? Everything was good. We, um... Everything was good because I had made so much money, I never was in the red. So yeah. I always was in the green from the start, from the beginning. So if we ever like took a loss or anything, it was all good. So bam, I sold a hundred thousand albums times 10, that's a million dollars. Probably do 12.99 a CD. That was like 1.2 million for them. It was cool, bam. Pretty Boy Swag went in a million copies, bam. That was cool. Then we read up for the budget to do a fourth album. So everything was cool. Okay. You know they was, they was, they knew what it was. I just was growing up. I was going through a lot. This is what 2011, so I'm 21 at this point. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And the record climate was changing. We had, you know, our futures coming in, and shit was changing up. So albums weren't really, you know what I'm saying? Shit, shit switched up. So I had to adapt to what was going on. Yeah, and, and people weren't really buying albums. People were just downloading. You know, I hit them like a, this. This is before streaming. 2010, 2011. The industry changed, you know what I'm saying? And I changed too. I grew up right in front of the people's eyes. Yep. And you know what I'm saying? It was just a lot, but we still did good though. Now, are you still with Collie Park? Still with Collie Park on the third album, but we was, we was doing a lot, it was a lot of riffs. It was a lot of back and forth and shit on that whole third album. He didn't want to be a part of the album at first, then he wanted to be a part of it. Then, you know what I'm saying? It was a lot of back and forth on that third album. Who were who the other people that you're working with? I was working with Violator. Rest in peace, Chris Light, you know what I'm mm. saying? Best manager I ever had. Oh, you signed, you signed a Violator? Yeah. Dope. Best, best manager I ever had in my career. Rest in peace. Rest in peace. I miss him, think about him every day. Yeah, and at that time, Violator had like 50 Cent. 50 Cent, Puff Daddy, Mariah Carey. Missy Elliott. LL Cool J. LL Cool J. We was lit. Pretty much everybody. So the album, album comes out, it does what it does. 
And then after that, you end up splitting with Interscope? I split with Interscope after my third album. After third album, why? Well, you know, Chris Lighty died, rest in peace. So he was over my project. So going into my third album, they did what they did. We read up to negotiate for the fourth album. We went in, in the middle of the negotiation, they confirmed, they confirmed the budget. They confirmed the green light. They said, okay, look, Soldier Boy got everything together. He got the music, the music sound right. We got these endorsement deals set up for him. He on another level in his career. I was meeting with Dr. Dre all the time, meeting with Jimmy Iovine all the time, you know what I'm saying? I was, it was like a very high point in my career. I dropped Mean Mug with 50 Cent. That shit did like eight million. How, how did you hook up with 50 Cent? I hooked up with 50 Cent. Through, through Violator? I been new 50 Cent way before Violator. If you if you go back in YouTube, Soulja Boy 50 Cent, you will see us. I met him when I went to New York one time. I went to do 106 and Park, and he did 106 and Park too. I met him. We did Rap City in the basement. Me and G on it. That was like 2007. First right. time I went to New York. So bam, back 2010 when I signed with Violator, he was just with them too, and we just clicked up. You know what I'm saying? But right. You know, me we dropped me and me and him. We shot the video. That shit did good for my album. That was on my third album. Right, because I remember you guys had the double XL cover. We did together. the double XL cover. Yeah, that, and was, then, that was a good look for both of y'all, I think. Yo, and then um, we negotiated for my fourth album, you know, and then Chris Lighty died, and then kind of everybody just dropped the ball, you know, because he was the manager. He oversee my project, so we, we, I kind of didn't know what to do. So. So you leave Interscope? I left Interscope, and then I, I, I just went everything, SODMG Records. Independent. But you caked up at this point? Caked up. Caked up, you know what I'm saying? Ran a, ran a lot of M's all the way up, so it was cool. It was like, okay, bam. Yeah. You know, now I got 100% control of everything. I could drop my albums whenever I want to. You know what I'm saying? I got three deals on the table right now. I'm probably gonna go to Epic. I'm gonna go to Epic with LA Reed. I go to New York on Friday. And I'm gonna meet with Atlantic. I'm gonna meet with 300. Lior. I'm gonna meet with um, RCA in E1 music, and then I'll come back to LA and I'll meet with Epic and I'll probably close it out with LA. Okay. But um, I was doing everything independent. Up until this point right now, I'm still independent. Now, what I found interesting, and I, I'm not exactly sure about the timeline, but at one point you and Ice-T started going back and forth. Yep. And it was like, it was sort of this iconic old school versus new school. And, and you see this happening today, but like that was sort of the first time that you had a well-respected, you know, OG old school artist go at one of the new big artists. Yeah. Like when that was happening, it, it never got all that serious, but, but what was your take on that whole situation? It was just, man, I don't know, man. Much respect to IC right now, the situation's so old. So it's like, I don't even like bringing it up and talking about it, but uh, everything cool now. I was 17, I don't know, he made a mixtape or something, so I was like, well, you suck or something, you kill hip hop and da da da. So I was just like, man, you just old ass nigga, man. Fuck you, nigga, whatever. I'm 17, nigga, with a million dollars. You like 40 something, nigga, talking about me. You don't even know me, nigga. I'm from Atlanta, nigga. I'm really from the hood, nigga. Fuck you talking about. You know what I'm saying? Like, you trying to discredit me, nigga. You don't know me, nigga. You know what I'm saying? But goddamn, on the YouTube, if you YouTube the YouTube, I was, I, was, I was 17, so it was more funny and shit. Now I'm 26 now. You know what I'm saying? Nigga disrespect me now. I slap the shit out of nigga. I don't give a fuck who it is. You know what I'm saying? But now, back then, I was 17, so I was just like, man, you should be a... I told him, I laughed about it. I was like, you an old ass nigga. Then I got serious, and I was like, bro, you should be ashamed of yourself, my nigga. You, tell, you, you like 40-something years old, and you talking about eat a dick. I'm 17 years old, nigga. My little sister, I got little sisters and little brothers and shit that heard that shit. They look up to me, nigga. You know what I'm saying? It's like, bro, you got me fucked up. I'm just doing what I gotta do to get out the hood to feed my family, nigga. You know what I'm saying? You talking about I can't rap, I kill hip hop, I did this, I did that. What the fuck is you talking about right now, nigga? I made a dance for the kids that was fun. You know what I'm saying? That shit got 150 million views on YouTube, my nigga. You ain't got no video that ain't got nothing near none of that. You know what I'm saying? I feel you, you an OG. Very not word, but he didn't know what the fuck he was talking about, basically. You know what I'm saying? And then I was just like, bro, you should be ashamed of yourself, my nigga. You, you tripping, bro. And then after that, he was like, well, you might be right on, no. Then the shit got squashed. You know what I'm saying? Well, you know? here's what's funny about that situation. And here's sort of my connection to all this. I was on an episode of The Boondocks. Yeah. And that episode was exactly about y'all two. 
Yeah, they made like a parody of me or some shit. They made a parody, and, yeah. and it was Thugnificent. And yeah, Sergeant Gutter. And Sergeant Gutter. And you were, you were Sergeant Gutter. Yeah. And Ice-T was Thugnificent. Thugnificent. Yeah, hey, no me and shit. And, and Thugnificent came on Vlad TV yeah, to Vlad diss you. Vlad TV on the show. Right. That shit was funny. And, and I, I didn't even know, like... I love the Bone Docs. That's, that's like that one was my favorite, favorite show on television. Ever, all time. I yeah. wish they would have just reached out and really got me on there the real way. Yeah. I would have killed that shit for them. But, but when, when you saw that episode of the Boondocks, what'd you think? I was like, damn, I'm famous as hell. <laughs> they make cartoons about me and shit on TV. What the fuck? Right, because I, I didn't even know about the whole eat a dick thing. I didn't, I didn't realize that they literally took that off of the... Yeah, eat a dick. They owe me some money for that shit. The fuck they talking about? Well, I, I think that was a symbolic, symbolic kind of thing in hip-hop, you know? Yeah. And uh, listen, I, I know both of y'all. I, I respect both of y'all a lot. Yeah. So I'm, I'm glad. I love I love. Oh, you talking about Ice-T, right? Yeah. I love Ice-T, man. Yeah. That was some shit. I don't give a fuck about that. I'm having millions and shit now. You had a comment that you made on, on the red carpet. You said, uh, shout out to the slave masters. Yeah. Without them, we'd still be in Africa. We wouldn't be here to get this, uh, this ice and tattoos. Yeah. A lot of people were upset about this. Yeah. So this is what happened. They tricked me, bro. I went and did an interview with BT. I never forget. I was like 16. And when we in high school, bro, we joke a lot, bro. Like we roast niggas, we make jokes, we crack jokes, we little kids, we teenagers, that's what we do. Bam, I'm fresh out of high school, bro. I'm, I went to BT, bro. I, this nigga, I never forget his name, Torrey. You know a nigga named yeah, Torrey? Torrey? He's an interview. He set me up, bro. He a tour, he's an interviewer nigga for BT. I don't know what the fuck he was on, but I get that, right? I'm, you know me, I'm cool. I'm cool with everybody. You know what I'm saying? I be happy all the time. I be chilling. I be, what's up, y'all? What's good? You know what I'm saying? He was like a little bitch. He was a little dog. Oh, oh, like a, like a fucking prick. You know what I'm saying? I said, man, what the fuck? What the fuck is this nigga? I start roasting his ass. Boy, you ugly as hell. Boy, what the fuck is wrong with you? He, damn, soldier, <laughs> soldier boy is very arrogant and blah, blah, blah. Boy, I, boy, I will treat your ass. Boy, I will roast the hell. Boy, you dusty as hell. Boy, what the fuck kind of shoes you got on? I'm roasting him. He getting mad. So he set me up. We do the BT interview. Just like that's you interviewing me and you interview, right? I don't know how he said. He asked me some stupid ass question. What you think about? I don't know what he said. And then I said that as a joke. He's like, what you think about, uh, what you think about Africa and the slave masters? I'm thinking like, he joking, I'm 16. I'm like, bro, I made a song called Crank That. I'm talking about Superman and dancing and shit. What the fuck is you talking about Africa and some slave masters right now, folk? I don't know what you talking about. I'm thinking he joking. I'm joking back with him. I said, man, shout out to the slave masters. They, I, if it weren't for them, we wouldn't be over here right now. That's true. Y'all came, they, the white people came and took us on boats and kidnapped us and brought us over here, bro. I was joking, you know what I'm saying? I apologize. You know what I'm saying? I didn't mean it like that. The NAACP, they know. The Farrakhan, everybody, the black people, they know I love the black people. You know what I'm saying? They know I would never like try to like downplay our, our race or joke on our, or joke on slave, bro. My, bro, my great great granddaddy was a slave, bro. You right. feel me? Like, I, I grew up in Mississippi where they still hanging people, bro. The KKK still down there. The white people is racist as fuck down there in Mississippi, you know what I'm saying? But I, but they, but I still did my thing down there, and I still, I got white homies and all that. One of my best friends is white, you know what I'm saying? So, but I respect the slave, man. Harriet Tubman, Malcolm X, you know what I'm saying? Martin Luther King, everybody that did what they had to do, they died for us. I respect them and I love them for that. I would never try to downplay no type of shit like that. So that's why I was so mad. They tried to betray me like that. They tried to blow that up too. Like, so was, I'm like, damn, bro. Like, y'all really, y'all stupid as fuck, bro. Like, I'm not, bro. I, my daddy raised me way better than that, boy. My grandmama will beat my ass. My granddaddy will beat my ass. My grandmama will slap the fuck out of me if she sees some shit like that and read it and think that it's true and think that I was for real. You know what I'm saying? So they know that too, though. So BT, whoever, like the people who published that comment, that statement and made that big, they stupid as fuck for even doing that. They supposed to call me and be like, are you serious? Or like, what's up? Let me clear that up or something. You know what I'm saying? Because they didn't play the whole thing. They yeah, just so the that's, soundbite. Yeah, so that's lame as fuck that I'm, I got to sit here now, years later, finally, and explain it to y'all like what really happened in the right way. You know what I'm saying? Fuck BT, fuck Teray. You were sort of like the first artist that just, you know, when you see like, for example, like Future dropping like three mixtapes an album in a year, like you, you were doing that. What, what was really the, the mentality over dropping that much music as opposed to like, you know, before you, you know, you get maybe one album a year out of a person, maybe one album every two years. But you were, you were dropping, like, what was the most number of projects you dropped in a year? I can't, I don't know. Y'all gotta Google that shit or something. But a lot. Yeah. Five, six, seven? 
Like six. Six. So every two months you'd be dropping shit. Why did you start dropping so many projects as opposed to saying, I'm just going to work really hard on this? And come I don't up know where I came up with the idea from, but I just remember um, one day I was in the studio in LA and, and I said I wanted to drop three mixtapes in one day. And then it started from there. So you know how much music you got to record to have three mixtapes in a day? So I did that. I think it was like 60 songs I just recorded. I put 20, I put 20 songs on each mixtape. It was 60 songs and I put Paranormal Activity, um, some shit with DJ Holiday, I can't remember the name of it, and then some other shit. It was three of them that dropped in one day on Halloween one time. And then that's when it started. After that, I just went crazy. And, and this was really kind of the internet mentality of quantity. You just gotta feed, you gotta feed the net. That way. Yeah. I got some shit too. I got some hard ass shit. Yeah. All my shit hard. All my new shit hard. I ain't got way better at rapping. Well, you mentioned in, a, in one of your interviews that you kind of simplify your style, but at one point you want to rap more and you're trying to be up there with the Jay-Z's and the Kanye's and all yeah, that. Yeah. Like, explain, explain that mentality. So basically, um, when, at one point I got this song called Two Millie. I got on my lyrical shit and I got a song called Kill Bill and I got a song called like Best Rapper, some shit, you can YouTube it. And, uh, I was just trying to be the best. I was just trying to go hard. I wanted to be the best rapper, Lil Wayne, to my he the best rapper and all this shit. I feel like I made so much millions and I did so much shit. I could be the best rapper, you know what I'm saying? Oh, fuck all that and all that shit. So Jay-Z, you know what I'm saying? I tried to just j jump in their lane and go lyrical. And then that shit was lame. You know what I'm saying? So Wait, being lyrical was lame? Yeah, that shit was For lame. Why? My fans liked it though. They was like, damn, he hard. Oh, he spitting old bars. Ooh, flames and shit. But that shit was lame. Like performing that shit. I'm Lartanic, Lil Brother, mind like, like that shit lying. So I just had to go back to my fucking. Ooh, look, 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 pull on your block, look, 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 ooh, chain, ooh, 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 ooh. How about the burp of the skirt? Ooh, chain, ooh, you know what I'm saying? They started going crazy for that shit. Fuck out that rapping shit. So, so you done with the lyrical shit? Nah, I'm hard as fuck. I'm done with the like trying to like put it in a pattern like New York bar shit. Mm -hmm. I'm hard in my own right now. I'm lyrical. How I how I spit my shit, you know what I'm saying? So let me see. Hold on. Uh, fifty thousand AP is gonna make you blind. Young rich nigga fell in love with the dollar sign. Hit the PJ with the bit that like all the time. Grab the Draco, shoot it up like the Colin. My collar, my jeweler, he pull it with ice chain. Two pistols on my hill like Max Payne. You know what I'm That's hard in my own right. Like I'm going crazy. Like in my yeah. own right, I ain't gotta be stupid to reason. I'm just a little lyrical. I ain't gotta be all that. I can scrape. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Rapping my way, and I'm going hard. What? Listen to my whole. Listen to King Soldier Six. Listen to um, what's the name? I'm finna drop Real Soldier for Life, November 18th. Listen to Ignorant Shit with Bow Wow from ending to the start to ending, and tell me I ain't got better as a rapper since Crank Dick. Well, you start out as both a rapper and a producer. And honestly, what do you enjoy more? Rapping. More than producing. Hell yeah. Why? What the fuck you mean? Producing just sitting there on the keyboard, man, man, what the fuck? I can do that shit in five minutes. I like rapping. I go hard. I like standing on the stage, spitting, doing shows, spitting, rapping. That shit hard. It's way harder than producing. But, but some of your productions have, have done some shit. They hard. I do both. I mean, Drake, we made it. Yeah, me and Drake, we made it. You know, it. And he even started, I said, Soldier Boy on the beat. That way. Uh, how did that come together? Shit, I just, oh, I did a mixtape called King Soldier 2, Team King Soldier 2. I made a song called Nigga, We Made It. Drake called me, asked me, can he get on it? I said, yeah. And he got on it. That was that. And, and we talked about this in the last interview. Like, he actually, when he said, when I wear it, I wear every Man, single. Man, fuck all that. You got me in trouble with that shit, too. Well, so how how did I get you in trouble for that? Uh, I did. I, I don't know if I said it. I said, you Drake. Drake got this line for me. Did I say that? I don't think I said that word for it. I said, I know he, I, I don't know. They, you tie it or you tied it though? They were like, I ain't, I don't know. You know how they do with the internet shit though. You could have tied it to something else. That whole interview went about that Drake shit. I just, I, I'm not saying that he literally, you know what I'm saying, made the bar up or took it from me or said it. I just saying though, everybody know when I be in the, in the house, I always had like five, six chains on. I always iced out. They were like, damn, why so you done it? So when he said that, I got all my chains on even when I'm in the house. He had to be talking about me. Who else he talking about? Because at the time, Drake ain't had no chains. 
Right. You know, we no chain. He just got that big old chain. At the time he said that bar, he didn't want to. I've been doing this shit since like forever. And I know that because now that line he did take from me was when I was back in the hood, I made a song called um, What's Handing It. And in the first two bars, I said, Tell me what's really going on. Soldier Boy back in this thing already. What's Handing It? Then that nigga dropped the song when he got on. And he was like, tell me what's really going on. Gigi Drake up in this thing already. What's happening in there? I said, what the fuck? That nigga took my bar. And then I was like, what the fuck? He took my whole, how I said it and everything. I said, what the fuck wrong with this nigga? Now I met him. He's like, oh, I'm a fan. You know, it's hard and da da da. I was like, oh, then it was cool. But Drake's been known for, for taking lines like that. I mean, he, he took Rapid Forte's whole Players Club verse. Yeah, but one, there's so. no nigga, you got me in trouble with that chain shit. Change the title on that shit, man. Right. Drake got the ball from me. I love you, Vlad. You my nigga. <laughs> you my boy. And, and you also produced the Nicki Minaj record. Yup. Yes, bitch. Yes. Yes, bitch. Yes. How did that Before come together? That suit, summer Jam, nigga. Fuck you talking about. Now, how did summer that come jam. together? It was a vine. I made a vine one day. I was at the house making the beat. And on the vine, I said, yes, bitch. Yes. And then I said, damn, that could be a song. So I, I told Nicki. I said, I got this song idea. What you think? She said, that shit. She called me back. She said, that shit hard as fuck. Listen to my verse. I said, damn, she played a verse. Uh, she said, come to the studio. I came to the studio. And then we put it out. Boom. What exactly did you do with Beyonce? Because weren't you credited on, on her Lemonade album? Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm credited on her last album as a writer. What did you write? I wrote um, on her song... Um, Hold on real quick. On her Lemonade album, she got a song that she says, hop up out the bed and turn my swag on. Oh. I took a look in the mirror, said, what's up? And she said, it's called Hold Up. So I wrote that. So I'm credited as a writer on she that She quoted album. you. How did it feel to hear Beyonce sing your shit? That's dope. I love you, Beyonce, thank you. They pay me, they pay me nice for that. I bet, it's Beyonce. She paid me a nice check. We covered this real heavily because I know, you know, and you know that because you were retweeting my shit left and right. The whole Lil Yachty, India, Westbrook situation. Uh -huh. From what I understand, it's all, it's all done and over with. When you look back at that situation, do you feel that you were justified in what you did or do you feel like you made some mistakes in the heat of the moment? I don't really want to talk about this shit, but since you my nigga though, I'm going to talk about it, man. Fuck all that shit. Lil Yachty. Text my phone and said, uh, I uploaded a picture of me in India. He texted me and said, take that picture down, that's my girl. So I texted her, I said, Lil Yachty, yo, yo boyfriend? And she said, no, I never met him before. So I got mad and then we started beefing. And then whatever happened, it's happened. I ain't got no regrets on nothing. And that's it. Did you and India talk afterwards? Yeah, we talked afterwards. And what was that conversation like? You know what I'm saying? Whatever. It, what, what, she, know, she know me. That's what people don't know. She know me. She been knowing me for years. So she know how I am. So the conversation ain't nothing. It just was what it was. Did you talk to Yachty afterwards? Yeah, I talked to Yachty. How'd that conversation go? Whatever, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Go YouTube. He leaked the conversation. He recorded me. Hmm. Did that bother you? Hell yeah, that bother me. The fucking other nigga ever doing recording me while I'm talking to you. If this ain't no, if it ain't no interview like we doing right now, why the fuck are you recording me while I'm talking to you? I mean, that's not even legal, is it? I don't know nothing about none of that. And you know, Yachty did say that, that he looked up to you. And you know, when you look at a lot of the new rappers, I mean, clearly they come from the soldier boy tree. You know, you're the root of all that. You know, you look at the little bees, you look at the Yachty's, you look at the, the Uzi Verts, you look at uh, a lot of dudes. I put Lil B on. Yeah, well he was part of SOD, SODMG. SODMG, yes. Right. Riff Raff was SODMG. I put all them niggas on. Um, a lot of people came through you. How come you don't think any of them really stuck around and, and kept, kept rocking with you? I don't know, you gotta ask them. But it didn't seem like you, you ever put them all on paperwork or really locked them in. I'm a real nigga. I ain't gonna take your soul. I 
I ain't gonna fuck your dreams up. If anything go wrong, damn, Soulja Boy, it's your fault. Nah, I'm gonna let you do your thing. I'm gonna see what your true character is. If you wanna go do your own thing, you can do your own thing. That way. You ain't holding nobody back. That way. That's what's up, that's noble of you. Most people would've, would've done paperwork. Nah, we do paperwork though. I have artists, that's in, I have a lot of artists that's in paperwork, but you know, we work off handshakes with, with, with most of them, you know. That's what's up. So, fast forward to today. You and Rico Reckless. He jumped into this whole situation with y'all. He said what he said, and then you, you kind of blacked out on Twitter. When you look at that whole situation, and, and I, I know Rico Reckless, I've, I've interviewed him before. Where is that at right now? Boy, shawty ass on, on a crumb. Shorty ass ain't on shit. He just dissed the whole Chicago and called, apologizing to everybody he dissed and shit. Come on, boy, he looking for clout. I don't even know why we talk about him right now, but he looking for clout. This is what he looking for right now. For he can't wait to watch this interview and me say his name because I never said his name and I don't even know him. He dissing me because of Lil Yachty. Uh, you feel me? You dissing me about a, a bitch. You dissing me about another man because a bitch he ain't never met. That's how you know the whole situation goofy. It ain't about no money. It ain't about no bricks. I ain't run off with your bricks. I ain't run off with your work. I ain't finessed you. I don't know you. You ain't never met me in real life. You, this is fake beef. This is, you trying to get famous off me. You made a song called Crank That on my beat. You goofy as hell. I'm having 100,000 cash on me right now. What are we talking about? Come on, bro. You, this man ain't never seen a million dollars in his life. What we just say? I met a million when I was 17. Rico, what? Boy, y'all is tweaking right now. Get the beef over with, you feel me? But whatever, man. If a nigga got a problem with me, bro, niggas can't beat me, bro. I'll beat the shit out of nigga, boy. We shooting the shit out of niggas, boy. All that, you feel me? But goddamn, I don't want to talk about that. And I, and I just want the shit to be gone and leave me the fuck alone because I'm about to sign this million dollar deal with, with my record label. And, I ain't had, trying to have a fist knock at my door if something happened to this man, you feel me? So it's like, bro, just gone, bro, you feel me? You already got, you already just dissed the whole Chicago, so don't nobody fuck with you, bro, you feel me? Everybody talks shit about you, bro, so it's like, you ain't doing nothing but digging your grave deeper, bro, by fucking with a legend, bro. You coming at a fucking vet, bro. I ain't, been, I ain't just a nigga that been in this shit for a year. I'm in this shit 10 years deep, boy, having M's. You tweaking, bro, I had your ass gone, boy, you just a fly. You feel me? Like, come on, my nigga. You ain't, he ain't on a crumb, he played basketball. I don't even know why he rapping like that, coming at me like that. I know you really know niggas that really know you, boy. Grew up with you, boy. Who is you, boy? You tweaking. Well, you've been in this game now over 10 years. You know real beef versus people trying to get on. So why even respond? Because I'm not for that, man. Ain't nobody finna be dissing me publicly. I don't give a fuck who you is. I'm responding to everybody. What's happening? Fuck you and fuck him and fuck whoever. I give y'all y'all five minutes of fame. Slap the shit out y'all niggas, boy. Beat the fuck out y'all niggas. Put it on world star. Y'all got me fucked up, nigga. I don't give a fuck who name one of y'all niggas is. You dissing on me publicly, we gonna see about you. But you don't think that's just playing into what they want to begin with? I don't give a with? fuck what it's doing. Don't talk about me, period, on nothing. Disrespect to my name, nigga. You don't know me, nigga. Fuck you talking about. Coming up next, you about to sign a new record deal. Yup. I feel like it's time. I've been doing this shit independent. But did, didn't, you have, a, didn't you have a didn't you have a deal with, with Universal at one point for your label? Universal Music Group, yeah, man. I got uh, Sylvia Rome, Universal Republic. Yeah, sent her Sylvia Sylvia Rome. That was years back. She had Epic now. She left. That deal over with. That's back. That deal over with. So you signed a new deal? No deal. You got a new album coming out? New album coming up. Soldierboytellem.net. Uh. That's the name of the album. It's gonna come out 2017 off a of major. I mean, when you see when you see like some of the older artists, like the Pete Rocks and so forth, and they dissing these new artists, which which kind of came from from your from your family tree, and when they say they they messing up hip hop and you know they can't really rap and it, it ain't timeless music and stuff like that, as someone who kind of sits in the middle of all that. What's your take on it? How do you feel? Man, I don't get no fuck about none of that. I'm getting money. At the end of the day, it's all about the money. We got, I got kids to feed, I got little sisters, little brothers and shit. 
who gives a fuck about who, what a nigga think about the way a nigga rap. I'm trying to get money, nigga, millions. I don't give a fuck about what a nigga think about how a nigga rap. Them niggas worry about the wrong shit. That's why them niggas, whoever, that's why niggas be broke, boy. Y'all worry about the wrong shit. You worried about it the way another nigga rap. You need to be worried about getting your mama and your grandma out the hood and make sure your fucking kids are straight for life. What the fuck is you talking about? When it's all said and done, when you think about the legacy the Soldier Boy leaves behind, what do you what do you think that you're really responsible for? What, what what's the mark that you left in music? I don't know, man. That's up for y'all to decide. I ain't never been the type of nigga to brag on themselves. I can sit here all day and tell y'all what y'all what I think I'm is and shit. It's just about what y'all think. It's y'all perception. I know what I'm is and I know what I want to be. You know what I'm saying? But I don't want to reveal that to the world because y'all might trick the fuck fuck me out of that spot and trick me out of it. Right now, I'm just doing I'm right where I want to be. And I'm doing just exactly what I want to do. So however y'all want to paint the story, y'all paint it. I got a quarter million dollar car sitting in my garage that I own. I'm not paying no notes on it. I'm having two Lamborghinis, two Bentleys, two Mercedes, a Hummer on eight, Corvette, Porsches, Ferraris, different hill, houses in the hills and shit. I don't give a fuck what the fuck, the, who cares? The legacy is the money. How much money did I make? I'm trying to make a, like a billion dollars before I die, you know what I'm saying? Well, Complex called you the, the father of modern rap music. Do you accept that? Yup. Yeah, I, I, actually, I actually agree. I think the blueprint- Don't gash me up, Vlad, just because you're sitting in front of me to tell me how you really feel. I, I think the blueprint that you laid out is what a lot of the new artists are following right now. That way. That's that's one hundred. That is true though. Yeah, the blueprint. They all watching one or whatever. You know what I'm saying? They, you know what I'm saying? But I like that though because they doing good with it. So yeah. it's like, damn, they keep getting most of us. Most of them, like, damn, this artist got that big from doing what he did. So I fuck with it. I love what they doing. Yeah, man. Me too. Me too. I never wanted to be one of them dudes that just sit there and say never hating. Yeah, hating. Never hating. Because because I always looked at it like, if this is popping right now. Let me try to figure out why it's popping. You know, let me not just be closed-minded and say, well, this ain't Rakim. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Let me figure out what it is. And, and this is how, okay, this is, oh, this is because of this melody, and this is how, yeah, okay, I got it. Right. It makes sense, and I, I could appreciate it for what it is. a lot of people don't get it, it, you gotta get it first. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. Now, when did you start getting your face tatted up? When I was like 17, when I was like 17, when I was like eight, when I was like 18. Okay. And what are the various tattoos? You got the Gucci sign? I got the Gucci logo in the middle of my forehead. Why, why, why the Gucci logo? I like Gucci too, but clearly uh, you like Gucci a little more than me. Um, man. I just felt like. I spent so much money on Gucci in my life. You know what I'm saying? Like, really a lot, a lot of money. And I'm like, damn, like, I know people that are probably never going to make that in their lifetime. Or some people that, you know, don't make that in a year. And I spent their year's salary on Gucci in like a day. Like, how much have you spent on Gucci? At least over a million dollars. You spent over a million dollars on Gucci? Yeah. So now it's like, you know, it just really meant something to me. I fuck with Louis Vuitton too, but I spent a lot of money on Gucci. I don't know what happened. Where, and I feel like they had such an effect on the black culture. You know, the first time I started getting money is, that was the first thing I started buying is Gucci. I, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I got some Louis, you know, like I got my Louis bag over there that I brought in, but, I, but there's something about, when you first got money, there's something about Gucci that makes you just wanna, oh. Uh. Yeah, like when, even like being in the hood, and seeing black people, dope boys and shit, they go buy Gucci hats, Gucci belts, Gucci. I'm like, damn, why does this, why does this like brand have such an effect on our culture? Like, why does people love Gucci so much? Yeah. But I love it too. Like, that shit hard as fuck. Like, and I don't know. I was just getting tatted, and I was like, fuck it. I, I was like, maybe they'll see this and give me an endorsement deal or some shit. Gucci stingy as fuck. I've never gotten. I talked to them though. They they talk to me though. Oh, do they? They talk to me. But Kanye Kanye broke that door down. I feel like he the one. He did the shoe with Louis Vuitton. He yeah. designed for. 
Giuseppe Zanotti, he had, you know, Yeezys. So shout out to Gucci, man. Let me get that endorsement deal, please. I got this shit in the middle of my forehead. But yeah, I started getting tattoos. My first tattoos with uh, SOD Money Gang. I got that when I was 17. That's my record label, that's my gang, that's my family. That's all that, you know what I'm saying? And uh, that was my first tattoo. Second tattoo was uh, this little nigga right here, SOD. With the, you know what I'm saying? That's me, it's a cartoon. You know what I'm saying? And then after them first two tattoos, I got my first tattoo by Mr. Cartoon. Yeah, after that, I just kept getting hit up. I fell in love with it. It's just like smoking a blunt, sipping lean, fucking a bitch. Once you do it one time, you want to keep doing it. I got my first tattoo. I fell in love with it. I just kept getting them. You know what I'm saying? After I made my first million dollars, I was like, okay, I can get tattoos on my face now. I'm never going to get a regular job again in my life. Right. So... You got Rich Gang tattooed on your face? Yeah, I got Rich Gang tattooed on my face. I got Lisa, that's my mama name. Okay. I got the Bentley logo, cause I spent a quarter million dollars cash with them on the car. Like, we embedded for life, like, what the fuck? Like, put that shit on my face, nigga, fuck that. You know what I'm saying? I got the, the, I got the palm tree, that's for Boulevard, supply my clothing line. I made, we about to sell the clothing line. I'm gonna make $15 million from that. So hmm. I was like, hey, I gotta tap that on my face, you know what I'm saying? You know, I got SOD for life on my eyebrows. You know what I'm saying? But you were talking about getting the tattoos removed on your face. I'm getting them removed. Is that for I'm sure? I'm getting them removed. I'm getting a Gucci tattoo removed. But the other ones are stayed? I don't know yet. I might, I just think, right now it's just the Gucci tattoo is the only one that's going away. For the movies. Hmm. For movies, they give me like a deal for movies and I don't want to keep putting makeup on my face and shit. 